This movie is hands down the Texas Chainsaw Massacre of a generation. Like, a movie like this only comes once, maybe every decade or two. I would say Terrifier is this generation's kind of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But before Terrifier was House of a Thousand Corpses. Because Rob Zombie literally took his vision of grindhouse horror and pushed it in front of the masses. It was a movie that shocked, awed, disturbed people and wasn't critically acclaimed or very well liked when it first was released. It wasn't until the cult following really started to build up the momentum for House of a Thousand Corpses that a lot of people started to really look at it and go, hmm, maybe it's not as bad as we originally thought. I was looking through the episodes of the podcast from weeks past, and I noticed that I haven't talked about House of a Thousand Corpses. Like, I'm just so surprised that I haven't talked about this movie yet, because it's literally in my top five favorite horror movies of all time. Like, this movie rejuvenated the horror genre, and then gave fans a cult classic that, like I said, we haven't seen since Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It gained a lot of controversy, though, and was pretty much hated upon release until it started to become that cult classic that emerged amongst the horror community. The idea for House of a Thousand Corpses, it goes back all the way to 1999, when Rob Zombie had designed a haunted maze attraction for Universal Studios. The studio began later on working on an animated Frankenstein film, which Rob Zombie was hoping to be a part of. So when designing a haunted house attraction specifically for this film, he got the idea for House of a Thousand Corpses. He then pitched the idea to Universal Studios, and, well, the rest is history from there. Production on House of a Thousand Corpses started in May of 2000 and was finished around Halloween of the same year. The film had a budget, which started between the 3 to $4 million mark. However, the final budget's completely debatable because Zombies described a final budget between 7 to $14 million. So what the final budget is still remains a mystery to this day. According to Rob Zombie, the original ending of the film also sucked like really bad so much so that the producers actually awarded him additional funds so that he can reshoot the ending with more elaborate sets he actually filmed the ending to be crap on purpose (laughs) for the fact that he wanted to get more money to make the elaborate ending that he really wanted to out of this movie universal also wanted the movie to focus more so on the group of kids who were on the road trip and then wind up in a terrible situation though Rob Zombie knew his audience. (laughs) He truly knew his audience with this movie, and he knew no one gives a shit about the kids in these types of films, (laughs) right? Like, we want to see the villains. And he he truly wasn't wrong, considering the Firefly family has now expanded into a trilogy of movies. So he definitely got it right with that assessment, and now we have awesome movies that we get to talk about. House of a Thousand Corpses was shot on a 25-day shooting schedule, with two weeks being spent filming on the back lots of Universal Studios. The house that is used in the film, it's the same house that was used in the Best Little Whore House in Texas film from 1982, and it can also be seen on tram tours at Universal Studios. The remaining 11 days were shot on a ranch in Valencia, California. The inspiration behind many of the bizarre rants from the Firefly family were inspired by home recordings from the Manson family, which Rob Zombie cites as a huge inspiration behind these characters and the way that they interact with each other. The character of Dr. Satan specifically was inspired by a 1950s billboard-sized poster which advertised a spook show starring a magician named Dr. Satan. And this is something that Rob Zombie apparently also has hanging in his house. The cast of the film consists of the infamous Firefly family, along with four teenagers on a road trip, and there's some police who are trying to find them, of course. The role of Captain Spaulding was given to the late Sid Haig, and I am so glad it was. Rest in peace, Sid. Man, he was such a good character, wasn't he? Like, even to this day, people still cosplay as him, people still talk about him. He is... He's as much of the face of the movie as the Firefly family is, in my opinion. Like, yeah, he doesn't get as much screen time as, you know, say, Otis or Baby, but he made this movie. He kickstarts it off, and whenever you think of House of a Thousand Corpses or even Devil's Rejects, you think of Captain Spaulding. You think of Sid Haig. <laughs> like, this movie just made him even more iconic than he already was. 
And Captain Spaulding is a character that dresses as a clown and owns a gas station along with a museum of curiosities. While we don't know from this film what Captain Spaulding's relation to the Firefly family is, we know that he's working with them to some extent. That's, that's really all we get from this movie. It's not until the sequel, The Devil's Rejects, that we actually find out he's the father of baby Firefly. And one of my favorite people is also in this movie, Bill Mosley. He plays the role of Otis B. Driftwood, and it was someone who was adopted into the Firefly family. Sherry Moon Zombie, of course she's in it, right? She's casted in every Rob Zombie movie, TV show, whatever. She was casted as Baby Firefly. And that's pretty much the foundation of the Firefly family right there. The names of each of these family members were taken from Groucho Marx characters. Captain Spaulding is a character in Animal Crackers from 1930, and the name of Otis B. Driftwood was inspired by a character in A Night at the Opera from 1935. The teenagers in the film, they were portrayed by talent who would go on to find mainstream success after this film. Like, we see Aaron Daniels portraying the character Denise Willis, Chris Hardwick was casted as Jerry Goldsmith, Jennifer Johnston was casted as Mary, and Bill Hudley was portrayed by none other than Rain Wilson, Dwight from The Office. Everybody knows Dwight. If you've never seen The Office, you've seen the memes. If you saw a photo of Dwight, you'd know who Rain Wilson is. <laughs> he played in House of a Thousand Corpses. However, despite all of this, the film still went through issues when it came time to release. Rob Zombie, he had an agreement to release the film through Universal, and he claimed in interviews that he was completely transparent with them on the type of movie that he was creating. However, later on in 2000, Rob Zombie receives a call from the head of Universal. They feared that the film would receive an N17 rating, which, of course, it would. <laughs> like, so it also led to the company refusing to release the film because of it. This caused House of a Thousand Corpses to be shelved for months upon months until Rob Zombie actually purchased the rights to the film from Universal. The fallout between Rob Zombie and Universal didn't squash his hopes, though. He later made a deal to release the film through MGM, with a release marked down for October of 2002. But, <laughs> Rob Zombie had to run his mouth a little bit, and he actually claimed in an interview that MGM had no morals for releasing the film. And, like, I get that he was probably joking, right, or trying to be a little bit controversial and promote the film. Like, I get being mockable and controversial and all that, but this shit is business. <laughs> like, you don't bite the hand that feeds you and then hope you'll still get what you want after it. Like, but it doesn't matter because we know the film got produced anyways. After that fiasco, Rob Zombie announced he was just going to release the film himself without any backing. Though this caught the eye of Lionsgate who had signed on to release the film. This was when Lionsgate was starting to venture into new types of films, and they started to produce more horror content, which I'm glad they did. I love Lionsgate horror films. Not as much as Bloomhouse, but I do love me some Lionsgate horror films. The first public screening of House of a Thousand Corpses was actually in Argentina on March 13th, 2003. The movie was then theatrically released on April 11th, 2003, making its debut in the UK at Fright Fest, which was the fastest selling event that night. The movie then went on to gross 3,460,666 on a limited opening weekend, and then $2,522,026 on the official opening of the film. Eventually, it grossed $12,634,962 in the U.S., with an additional $4,194,583 from the rest of the world. So really, not bad for Rob Zombie's first outing of a horror movie to make, you know, over, what, $16 million? That's pretty good. I'm pretty sure that's even more than Terrifier made, which is, is pretty sweet. Although Terrifier had a much lower budget than even what is rumored to be reported for House of a Thousand Corpses. And if you haven't seen House of a Thousand Corpses, you're definitely missing out. Like I'm telling you right now, it, it's an excellent homage to movies like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you know, Hills Have Eyes, all those backwoods classics. Like, it's gory, it's campy, it's got some humor to it. And the Firefly family, they're definitely a group that you can root for, as, as messed up as that may sound. So let's dive in and talk about all the awesome moments in House of a Thousand Corpses. The date is October 30th, 1977. We have two amateur criminals, Killer Carl and Richard Wick. They're making an armed robbery attempt at a gas station slash horror museum attraction. However, 
they don't know who they're messing with. <laughs> they end up being killed by the owner of the place, who is none other than Captain Spaulding. Then we get to see a group of unlucky teenagers who we know are about to enter into a whole world of mess. They're on the road with the intent of writing a book that documents offbeat roadside attractions, which is a pretty cool idea when you think about it, right? Especially considering the time frame of the 1970s. It's a perfect time for a book that gives you a roadmap of some pretty cool and obscure places. Kind of like it. I dig it. I'd buy it. <laughs> and it's 2022. <laughs> So the four of them end up at the Museum of Monsters and Mad Men, where they meet the owner, Captain Spaulding. When he's asked about the area and the attraction, he ends up talking about the legend of Dr. Satan. He tells them where they can find and learn more about the legend should they dare. And of course, teenagers in horror movies, they're generally dumb as fuck, <laughs> right? So, of course, as soon as they find out about this legend of Dr. Satan and all the horrific things that come with it, they had to make haste towards the legend of Dr. Satan. So they head off in search of a tree that Captain Spaulding had told them, which uh, was supposed to be the location where Dr. Satan was hanged. On the way there, they end up picking a young, free-spirited hitchhiker up named Baby. Which wouldn't have been uncommon during those times, right? Picking up hitchhikers that look like hippies, a little free-spirited. Totally, totally not out of the norm, which is something what I really enjoyed that Rob Zombie has a way of doing, which is encapsulating an era. And he really did a good job at encapsulating the 70s era and the mentality of people in this movie, though he could have done more, I feel, to create an atmosphere that was the 70s because it still felt a little too polished for the 70s area. But that's just my opinion. So Baby ends up telling the group that she only lives a few miles away and then asks them if she can be dropped off at her home. They oblige, and as they're heading down towards Baby's house, a mysterious figure appears hiding in some bushes and shoots out their tire with a shotgun. Red flag number one. <laughs> though, though in typical horror movie trope fashion, because horror movies don't exist here, <laughs> the group thinks their tire just blew out, and they have zero suspicions surrounding Baby or their environment. Baby ends up trying to be the savior to this and tells him that she can fix it. Her brother's a mechanic, <laughs> or something like that, which to me would have been red flag number two if I was in their shoes, but, but I digress. Like, I'm sorry, if something goes south or something that you're not expecting just goes down and shit's going down and you're in the middle of nowhere, and then someone you randomly picked up like five minutes before that went down just out of nowhere says, oh my god, I can coincidentally help you with this issue that just randomly happened. Sketchy. <laughs> Baby ends up taking Bill to her family's house, where they can get a tow truck, and her half-brother Rufus shows up, takes the teenagers to their family home. This is where shit really starts to pick up, and there's a massive amount of creep factor involved here, because we get to meet Baby's family, including her adopted brother Otis, her deformed giant half-brother Tiny, Mother Firefly, and Grandpa Hugo. Everyone, including the teenagers, is sitting at this large table, being treated to dinner in the most creepiest dinner setting possible. Like, this thing looked like something out of Texas Chainsaw Massacre mixed with Hills Have Eyes. Like, it was just creepy as fuck. So, Mother Firefly, she begins to explain that her ex-husband Earl suffered a psychotic breakdown and had tried to burn Tiny alive inside the Firefly house. Great story to have around the dinner table, right? <laughs> like, welcome to our home. This is uh, how everyone almost died. And once the dinner was concluded, the family puts on a Halloween show for the teenagers. And Baby ends up getting Mary upset because she's flirting with her boyfriend, Bill. Mary, of course, gets defensive and threatens Baby, which is then when Rufus tells them that the car is finally repaired. So they're like, okay, before shit goes south, <laughs> let's, let's just get out of here. You know, cooler, cooler heads prevail. <laughs> let's, let's leave before they kill us. Things seem like they're, you know, kind of turning up for these kids a bit at just the right moment. Though we know that this is Rob Zombie. <laughs> there's, there's no way in hell that these kids are going to make it out alive. So as the teenagers head out and they're trying to leave in their car, we see that the scarecrows surrounding them are actually Otis and Tiny in disguise. They end up attacking the teenagers in the driveway and hold them captive. Found footage shots are seen throughout certain parts of the movie, which kind of depicts the gruesome events that are unfolding with the teenagers and the Firefly family. Otis, for example, kills Bill, 
and completely mutilates his body into what he considers a piece of art. (laughs) This thing looked incredible, by the way. It was a great practical. Mary gets tied up in a room where Otis is tormenting her. Denise gets dressed up as a doll and tied to the bed, (laughs) while Jerry gets partially scalped because he fails to guess Baby's favorite movie star. Like, how much more fucked up can you get than that? Now for some realism to the film, because if this was real life, parents would be looking for their kids, right? (laughs) Like, they didn't show up after a long night drive down the highway and no word from them the next day. Something's up. This is where Denise's father, Don, comes into the, the story. He contacts the police and reports her missing. Two deputies end up getting dispatched to try and find the missing teenagers, George Wydell and Steve Nash. They end up finding the car, which the teenagers are riding in, though it's been left in an abandoned field. When the deputies investigate the vehicle, they find a mutilated cheerleader in the trunk, and this would be one of the cheerleaders who was actually mentioned earlier in the film as missing for over a week. So we know that these group of teenagers that are at the Firefly house, probably not the first group of people to be brutally murdered. (laughs) Just a thought. We then find out that Don is a former policeman, and he gets called to the scene by the deputies to help out with the search for his daughter and her friends. They end up arriving at the Firefly house, where all these events are unfolding and taking place in real time. Wydell ends up questioning Mother Firefly first about the missing teens, though when turning to look away from Mother Firefly, she ends up shooting him in the head and killing him. And this scene is my favorite scene in the entire movie. Between the score, the pacing, and the way it was shot, This scene was both disturbing, sad, and borderline funny all at once. Don and Steve end up finding more bodies of the missing cheerleaders in a barn when they start searching other areas of the property. Don and Steve both get killed by Otis in a standoff that I believe lasted something like 46 seconds of silence before he pulled the trigger on this guy. It was actually a really suspenseful scene. Something like that, and I felt... Something like that, I felt, was a good way not only to build suspense, but to show how far the character will go to inflict fear with with a little bit of a side of hope, (laughs) right? Because of how long it's taken, the guy's thinking, maybe he's not going to shoot me. No, no, he's going to fucking shoot you. (laughs) Later that night, the three remaining teenagers get dressed up as rabbits and taken down to an abandoned well on the property. Otis had ended up skinning Don after his death, and he starts using his dead face as a mask and then torments his daughter Denise with it. (laughs) Like, super fucked up, but so awesome at the same time. Mary, of course, tries to run away, but gets tracked down by Baby and stabbed to death. (laughs) Otis and the rest of the family, they take the bodies, and then they burn them on a pyre. Jerry and Denise, however, they get placed inside a coffin, and then slowly lowered down into a well, where we get to see the failed experiments of Dr. Satan. They're all breaking the coffin open, and they end up pulling Jerry away. Denise is left to find her way through an underground lair where dead bodies are, like, engulfed into the walls. Like, the walls of this, like, underground tunnel are made of skeletons and dead bodies. It looked pretty cool, actually. This is where Rob Zombie got that extra budget for this ending. (laughs) As Denise makes her way through the tunnels, filled with all these mutilated corpses, she finds at the end of the tunnel, Dr. Satan. Along with him, she finds a number of mental patients, and Jerry's being operated on by Dr. Satan as well. We then see Dr. Satan call upon this gigantic mutant assistant to capture Denise. And we actually find out that, well, this was the husband that supposedly died because he tried to kill Tiny. This is Earl. He tries to capture Denise before she runs away and ends up escaping to the surface, crushing Earl with falling debris from the tunnel. She keeps on climbing and fighting and ends up making her way to the road, being picked up by none other than Captain Spaulding. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> way to make your return to the movie at the very end, acting like you ain't got nothing to do with this. <laughs> that was probably my favorite thing is when she gets into the car, Captain Spaulding just acts like, like, oh my God, you're one of those missing girls. Holy crap. Hey, are you okay? Let me help you. Blah, 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 blah. But <laughs> it's not that way. <laughs> so Denise ends up passing out on the front seat of Captain Spaulding's car, right? She's exhausted. She's scared. That's when we see Otis come up from the back seat with a knife, <laughs> right? Like it's not going to be that. It's not going to be a cheery ending. Let me tell you, it's a Rob Zombie movie. Come on. So Denise wakes up on the same operating table that she had just seen Jerry on. And she's surrounded by Dr. Satan and his mental patients. That's how the movie ends with her screaming 
getting operated on by Dr. Satan. Dr. Satan! <laughs> you know, House of a Thousand Corpses really did everything it could to embrace torture porn and just be exploitive. <laughs> like, that was its purpose. It's also a film where the exploitation is not the only showcase, but the antagonists themselves are also part of the spectacle. This can be seen when the movie highlights the numerous moments that Otis goes psychotic and the sexuality of Baby Firefly. The aesthetics of the film as well are quite similar to disturbing movies of the past, like I've mentioned, right? Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Hills Have Eyes. This whole film just exudes that carnivalesque madness with a side of backwoods drama that I really feel added to the cult following that this movie found years after its release. Not to mention that this movie really cemented Rob Zombie in not only the horror community, but as a horror director. Like, I'm sure many of us remember or first heard of Rob Zombie at, through his music, right? Like, Dragula, the, what was it called? Hillbilly Deluxe, I think that was the album that came out there. Everyone knew that song, Dragula. It was a hit in the clubs, pretty sure it was in the Matrix. So people really knew Rob Zombie at the time as a musician. A guy who looked scary as fuck, because he, he looks like a terrifying individual if you just saw him walking on the street. But that's really what we knew him as. And then he took his vision to life, made House of a Thousand Corpses, and now he's cemented himself as an icon in the horror community. Like, whether you love him or hate him, his movies are always a topic of conversation. Like, whether it be House of a Thousand Corpses, Devil Rejects, Three from Hell, Lords of Salem, Halloween, <laughs> 1 and 2, like, it, the monsters, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. Whenever Rob Zombie puts something together, there's always a conversation about it. Because he'll take things to a whole new level. Like, he doesn't just give you face value, this is it, this is what you've seen before. Other people have, you know, made this kind of movie, or they've done this kind of effect, or they've done the story in this way. He always will put a very unique spin on things. Whether or not, you know, we, we can debate all day that Sherry Moon Zombie shouldn't be in his movies, and that it's favoritism and blah blah blah, and that she can't act. These are all things I hear. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because Rob Zombie will always produce a good film. Of course, there's movies that we hate, you know, that I even hate. Like, I don't like what he did with Halloween 1 and 2. I really don't like his take on Michael Myers or the story or how he really portrayed a lot of the characters in it. But that doesn't mean that it's a bad movie. It just means I don't like it, right? If you really analyze his movies, they always have a message. They always have a unique tone, depending on what the movie is. So you can't really necessarily say Rob Zombie is a bad horror movie director or a bad storyteller. You just may not agree or like some of his methods of providing that story, which is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But the one thing we can't deny is that Rob Zombie will definitely be continuing to pave the way for many other horror films and stories to come, and will always be remembered as somebody who gave us brutal, disturbing films. Thank you guys so much for checking out this episode of the podcast where we went over House of a Thousand Corpses. Next week, we're doing something really special. We're going to be talking about two movies next week that I don't think many people actually know about. And the reason why is because I didn't know about this, and if I didn't know, I feel like a lot more people may not know, and I don't really see anybody talking about these movies. They're, it's called The Devil's Carnival. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's pretty much like an alternate reality, almost was a sequel to Repo a Genetic Opera. So we're going to be talking about those two movies next week, both one and two. So that gives you guys a chance to go on Tubi right now, because they're both free on Tubi. Go on Tubi, search The Devil's Carnival. There's two films. One's a short film that's like 50 minutes, and then there's another full-length film that's, I think, about an hour and a half. Watch both of them, because I'm going to be watching the second one. I've watched the first one, and I really enjoyed it. Great cast, awesome story. I'm going to be watching the second one this week, so that next week, we're going to be talking about both Devil's Carnival movies. Now, while you're watching that movie, I want you to notice something. There is an actor in both those movies that connects with these two episodes. That is your only hint for the final episode of Season 1. See you in the shadows. <laughs>